say thank you to all of the amazing organizers, uh, Laurel Macy, um, incredible work, uh, Tina Grandinetti, Linda Rich, uh, Leanne Wang, and Kyle Kajihiro. Thank you so much for uh, making this night possible. Um, mahalo. Thank you, Linda. Okay, so before we begin, oh, and I'd also like to thank our co-sponsors, the Church of the Crossroads, Hawaii Peace and Justice, and the University of Hawaii at Manoa Department of Ethnic Studies. So mahalo nui for our sponsors. Also mahalo to Mano Mei Singh, Sandy Yi, Tai Tengon, and Janetta Yuasa for your contributions. Um, and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, so we'll begin with an oli. So, in that chant, e iho ana, uh, is a chant um, by Kapihe, who foresaw uh, long ago, before the coming of Captain Cook, uh, that a great force would come to Hawaii and transform the nation and transform the people, and that one day, the people would rebel and overturn the status quo uh, to return that which is pono. And um, it's in that spirit that we are here today uh, to restore um, a sense of balance and to restore that which is pono, that which is righteous, uh, that which is in alignment uh, with all that is and all that will become. So thank you everyone for being here. It's such a pleasure to, um, to share this space with you. Uh, I am not going to lead a hula, but I will introduce um, a wonderful haumana, who is an incredible force. And um, I want to introduce Ihilani Lasconia. Mahalo nui. Welcome, Ihilani. Um, a couple weeks ago, uh, Dr. L asked if I wanted to share something that I wrote. Um, and then I talked to my other professor in Ethnic Studies, Munisha Daskupta. She said I could get extra credit for it, so I said yes. <laughs> so I'm here. Um, I guess, uh, so one of the, uh, first, um, my name is Kaihilani Lasconya. I'm from Ko'olaupoko, Oahu an ethnic studies major, and so I was really fortunate to get, a, get to take a class from Dr. L. Last year, it was on race, indigeneity, and environmental justice, and I think one of the biggest takeaways that I had from that class was um, learning about her scholarship and, um, I guess, carceral geographies, and then in my experience, not only as a first-generation student, but uh, a Hawaiian student at this so-called Hawaiian place of learning, how can carceral carceral geographies also be uh, academic spaces, universities, colleges, and how even though they let Hawaiians in, how do they gatekeep the things that we learn, the things that we think, the things that we see and do. Um, so the song that I'm gonna share with you folks, um, it's a spoken word or rap. I wouldn't really consider myself a rapper, I just like to share my feelings. So um, I really, um, I guess I wrote this in mind with, I guess, um, the struggles going on in Mauna Kea, the TMT, my experience as a student. Um, and when we're talking about abolition and abundance, I feel like you can't have those things without the occupation and uh, decolonization. And so that's just kind of what it talks about. So I'm gonna press play on my laptop and here it goes. Right. Yeah. Might take some time, um, I have a long password. 
Don't give them a reaction, sit back and laugh as we deploy the methods to the madness. Stay strong and organized, and then we mobilize. Don't need a telescope to see a bunch of racist guys. Impose those bullshit fines, just for being Hawaiian. All in the unjust name of motherfucking pseudo sign sign Neil for the flag, but I stand for the Mauna. This is all too literal, there is no employed pounder. Hit hard like one point pounder, I kui and kue. Ikea la on me each and every day. That means every day, yeah. Guys, <laughs> passing around. Now I need to arrest. I will gladly be the next. An exit across my chest makes for good target practice. This is not civil unrest. It's interest to divest. Kanaka Mali defending what? Kupuna left. Track record of mismanagement and we ain't really having it. Go bulldoze your own temple, cause the Aina is a Sabbath. Calling out the border regions, fabrications like a seamstress, TMT and don't care fuck that. I guess that UH is the mistress, mistrust the system, a Hawaiian place of learning. We all really know it's just a haole place of earning. Not indigenous serving, but cultural prostitution. A multiracial paradise is the center of illusion. It's not about homogeny, it's about Kanaka, honestly. All the ratio is their gain and it's free of fighting policy. It's written in the clause, you see that no one's got the time to see. Lucrative and victimized, how colonizers always be. So Kanaka, stand up. So Kanaka, stand up. Tell this institution that you've had enough. So Kanaka, stand up. So Kanaka, stand up. Tell this institution that you've had enough. And allies, stand up. And allies, stand up. Tell this institution that you side with us. And allies, stand up. And allies, stand up. Tell this institution that you side with us. And everyone stand up. Everyone's already standing. Everyone stand up. Put your face to the sky for the I know you love. And everyone stand up. And everyone stand up. Put your face to the sky for the I know you love. Mahalo. <laughs> Shout out to Dr. L for inviting me, um, Dr. Monisha for giving me the extra credit, and Dr. Kyle for supporting me, as well as Kumu Kavika. I love ethnic studies. Thank you so much. Aloha, I am Dr. L. You can all call me that. Um, so one of the best things about my job, oh, I'll say my actual name. It's Laurel May Singh. You, you have to call me Dr. L if you're in my class, but if you're not in my class, then you can call me Laurel. So Ihi, you can call me Laurel now because you're no longer in my class. Um, so I'm an assistant professor of ethnic studies here at University of Hawaii Manoa, and I'm also on the board of Hawaii Peace and Justice uh, with Kyle Kajihiro, Sandy Yi, Anne Wright, um, Wally Inglis. Um, so we have an awesome group. And I wanted to talk for very briefly about what is abolition, because that's something a lot of people have been asking um, you know, in the lead up to this event. So abolition, in the shortest definition, is it's imagining and working for a world that supports abundance, reconciliation, and healing, and it transforms the conditions that rely on punishment. So its genealogy can be traced to W.E.B. Du Bois in 1935. He wrote a book called Black Reconstruction in America, and he proposed this idea of abolition democracy. So this was in the 1860s to 1870s, and there was this moment after the abolition of slavery with vast potential for social and economic change. And Du Bois and others viewed the abolition of slavery as only a first step to transform the conditions of capitalist exploitation. Um, that relies on racial divisions. So abolition is open-ended and it's to imagine new formations. 
the, most, the more recent genealogy could be traced to the black radical tradition, the work of Cedric Robinson, who wrote a book called Black Marxism, the work of my advisor and mentor, Ruthie Gilmore, and it's about black intellectuals confronting racial capitalism and mass incarceration, and we can trace it to the, to the maroon communities and quilombos where escaped slaves formed these multiracial communities um, to defy slavery. Um, but we can also trace it to organizing here in Hawaii. And its most powerful iteration can be seen in Pu'uhonua. And one place that many of us have been is Pu'uhonua o Pu'uhuluhulu on the summit of Mount, Mount Kea. And these are spaces of asylum and refuge from punishment where we see these vibrant formations that are drawing from the past to build new futures. Um, we see at Hunana Niho University, at Waimanalo, um, where people are fighting irresponsible land use developments that they did not consult with the community, similar to the TMT. We see with the Kia'i of Kahuku fighting the wind farms that the community did not consent to. And all, Pu'uhonua and all these formations are drawing from Aloha Aina. So these are um, love of the land or love of the environment. And this is drawing from independence of the Hawaiian nation and interdependence. Um, and there, all these formations are fun, confronting colonialism and environmental racism to imagine and work for futures rooted in justice and abundance. So with that said, I have a couple of announcements to make. Um, if you haven't made a donation yet, we highly encourage you to do so just to make sure we can cover food. This is an all-volunteer venture. Um, supported generously by Hawaii Peace and Justice and the Department of Ethnic Studies, and we could use any donations you're able to make, $5 suggested donations, um, and all the donations will go towards cleaning staff to cover food, and if we have any left over, it'll go to our partner organizations fighting for justice. Um, and there's Venmo is an option. And other housekeeping is there's a bathroom outside that way, so just make your way outside and go that way. And um, if you have questions, we're going to have some time for Q&A at the end, so write your questions on index cards. So we can pass more out for those who didn't get it, but there's also index cards out there. And that's how we'll be taking Q&A. Um, so can I please invite the speakers to come up to the stage and we'll get into our round table. So I am absolutely thrilled to introduce our amazing roundtable today. Um, yeah, I started dreaming about this, this panel maybe a year ago, so it's super exciting to see it coming into fruition today. So our first speaker today will be Kalehau Kamau. He is a Mauna Kea Kia'i for 116 days um, and is currently... <laughs> and is currently a leader with Ohana Ho'opakele, and they're an organization that's fighting and working for Pu'uhonua as alternatives to prisons. So he's amazing. Our next speaker is another amazing speaker. I guess I just, everyone's amazing. Um, <laughs> is Melanie Yazzie. Um, she's an assistant professor in the departments of Native American Studies and American Studies at the University of New Mexico, and a co-founder and on the culture desk of the Red Nation, a grassroots native-run organization committed to the liberation of indigenous people from colonialism and capitalism. Our next 
Awesome speaker is Heilani Sonoda, Sonoda Pale. She is Kanaka Maoli and the chair of the Political Action Committee of Kalahui, Hawaii. Our next speaker is my dear friend, Dejanae Dozier. She was my colleague at the CUNY Graduate Center and is an assistant professor of geography at Long Beach State and has worked on abolitionist housing struggles in New York City and Los Angeles. Our next speaker, another dear friend, is Kalani Opua Young. She's a Manu Wahine and a queer trans Pacific Islander Mahiai and Levaya from Waianae. She's a former board member of the United Terries of Pacific Islanders, of Pacific Islands and Alliance, and is a founder of Tent City Queens at Pu'uhonua Owai'anai, and teaches at UH West Oahu. And our last but not least, another amazing wahine is Lian Wang. She is assistant professor, oh, sorry. Oh, it's okay. Okay, so that's, that's Kalani Opua, and this is Lian Wang. Um, Kalani wanted to sit on the end of the table, so we had to accommodate that. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, so Lian Wang is an assistant professor of Asian American Studies and Social Welfare at UCLA, and her work is on immigration law and criminal enforcement at the site of gender and sexual violence, and her collective work has been with abolitionists, feminists, and women of color anti-violence groups. Our facilitator today is another dear friend, Kyle Kajihiro, and he is on the board of Hawaii Peace and Justice and was the former director of the American Friends Service Committee Hawaii Area Program. So we'll be having, everyone will speak for about nine minutes, we'll have a timekeeper, and then we'll have discussion amongst the panelists and then we'll take questions from the audience on your um, index cards. Mahalo and I'm look for, looking forward to this. <clears throat> Aloha mai kako. Aloha. All right. Uh, my name is uh, Kalehao Kamau and um, uh, born and raised on Oahu, uh, Papa Kolea Hawaiian Homestead. Uh, presently, on uh, I live on uh, Alahula Hulukupuna, which uh, formerly known as uh, Manokia Access Road. Uh, uh, up there, doing what I can to malama and take care of of our uh, mauna and also our kupuna. <clears throat> Um, just, uh, just a little background about myself, uh, which, is, uh, which is what I think I'm over here for. But uh, I grew up in a really good family, a good um, a culturally oriented family. Uh, my mom um, was a kumuhula, my dad another Hawaiian practitioner, fisherman, navigator. Uh, but uh, back in the 70s, uh, uh, I kind of gravitated away from that. That took me away off into this distant road of drugs and alcohol and everything, uh, made some bad choices which resulted in me doing a lot of time in prison. Um, uh, during the ending part of my long years behind bars, you know, I started to see the benefits in those things that my parents were trying to teach me all those years when I was young. And uh, so I went on this um, this thing to kind of uh, go uh, recapture, you know, um, all these things, um, cultural identity. And uh, this led me into an area, especially after I was a part of a group that was departed away from Hawaii to a private for-profit prison in uh, Minnesota. And uh, it is there that uh, we, uh, many of us, um, well, we, we uh, experience um, uh, this differences between uh, culture and some racism and things like that. But in my efforts to kind of uh, keep our 
um, uh, cultural practices going. <clears throat> um, it led into us fighting the system and eventually turned into a lawsuit, which uh, we won. And so today we have, uh, um, we have that recognition, the Native Hawaiian uh, spiritual practices are allowed in the prison, uh, but uh, very limited still, and there's a lot more work to be done. I'm uh, glad uh, to be here, and I see a lot of people that, uh, that was very instrumental in uh, making this happen, one of which is uh, Hialani right here. You know, she did classes on the inside. A lot of those things we continue in our program um, after we were shipped abroad. And uh, also, uh, Umi at the back of the room. Glad to see you here, Umi, who continues with the program <clears throat> that we continued. Um, so they go in, and it's still very limited to that once a week meeting and the recognition of uh, Makahiki, which we are in right now. We're in Makahiki season. And um, so they, they're carrying on the, that thing, and we still, uh, and this is like uh, 10, over 10 years ago, but we still at that very minimum of that uh, lawsuit that we had won like 15 years ago, or 2003, I think. Yeah. So uh, a lot of work to be done, and we, we, there's a lot of uh, deep, deep racism in this system. I mean, it's just systematically uh, geared around, um, you know, they don't, they don't want to uh, allow, you know, anything, anything. And, and, and like this, this is something good that represents healing, restoration. We spoke about the Pu'uhonua. The Pu'uhonua traditionally was a place where people went to sought a safety, but also to uh, restore the relationship that was broken between uh, the Aina, between uh, the people they harmed, and, and the Na'akua, <clears throat> place of restoration. So um, they're not interested in hearing none of that. Um, by the same token, you know, we have every other religion in there, uh, from Mormon to, you know, uh, Christianity, everything, and it's full-blown full blown supported. But when it comes down to Kanaka spiritual practices, these things are shut down. In fact, when I was in Arizona, the public safety uh, uh, department head uh, said, uh, got on, they did let us practice for a little while, and they shut us down, and they, um, they told the warden that, uh, scolded the warden and said that, you know, oh, don't let them do this. There's no such thing as a Hawaiian religion. And, and, uh, and, and, and you're helping them set a precedent. And, you know, so the warden shut us down because they were, according to the warden, the paying customer. So, you know, on and on and on and on. From Arizona, shipped to Oklahoma because of the lawsuit and started up again then. But the good news is uh, we won. Uh, there is, we can, we are allowed to go in, but like I said, there's a lot more work to be done. Um, the connection, you know, I'm at the Mauna now, you know, when, when the call came out, in fact, before um, Ige, um, mahalo to Ige for announcing that um, it start construction on Monday. Uh, <laughs> you know, see you on the Mauna, so we went up, and, um, it's a, it's, a, it's a really, you know, um, spiritual experience. We do uh, protocol four times a day, and all these things that we're doing is very spiritual, and it connects. And there is, um, you'll find nothing but aloha, and it's at a totally different level. You know, um, another thing before I stop is um, I'd like to mention that <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago, or maybe a month ago, uh, something came out on Facebook that uh, people on probation or parole were not allowed to go anywhere near, um, um, uh, not Daniel K. Inouye, but what is it? Saddle Road. Uh, go nowhere near Saddle Road. Nowhere near where uh, uh, everybody is camped out. But in my... Uh, 
my opinion or my observation, <clears throat> that is the best place they could be right now. Participating in the AHA, that is the most healing thing I've ever experienced. And uh, so I understand that there are some efforts for uh, address that, uh, that other racist thing that they targeting uh, native or yeah, native practitioners or Hawaiians. And with that, you know, uh, whatever questions in the end, mahalo. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Yad e, yad e shik e, do shid na e. Sha e melani yazi ni sha. Bilagana nishle, ma e de shkijni bashis chin. Bilagana dashi chero totsani dashi nale. Akut az adan nanishle. Yad e means hello, it is good. Uh, my relatives and my people. Uh, I just introduced my clans. If I were to go on longer, it would take up all nine minutes, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Anyone who's ever come to the Southwest and deals with the Nair Navajo people, you know that's true. Uh, I just wanted to thank Laurel for inviting me here. Um, I'm actually here for the American Studies Association Conference. Um, I'm an academic part-time. I'm an organizer full-time <laughs> in the Red Nation, the work we do. Uh, so I'm really thrilled to be in an organizing space. Uh, we have a really vibrant peace and justice center and a community in Albuquerque doing really radical, phenomenal work um, that I'm a part of. So uh, since I have about seven and a half minutes now, um, to say this. So something that happens in the continental U.S., um, and that's really important for understanding the carceral geography of the American Southwest are reservation border towns. How many of you have heard about a border town before? Yeah, wow, a lot of you, like half of you. So I grew up in a border town in Arizona, um, uh, bordering the Navajo Nation, and border towns are named as such because they border what are typically, typically considered tribal or native land. Right, but the thing that, about border towns is that those spaces are actually off reservation, meaning that they're claimed by the United States as sort of US settlements. They're not kind of towns or cities that fall within reservation boundaries. Uh, but nevertheless, because they border uh, large tribal land bases and there are a lot of indigenous people who traverse and go into border towns for shopping, um, about 50% to 90% of the population in border towns is indigenous, which is utterly unique, right, in the landscape of US cities, again, right, non-off reservation cities, um, urban spaces and towns. Uh, the logic of settler colonialism dictates that indigenous people are not supposed to exist anymore, right? Um, that we're not supposed to be off reservation, which is a military term, right, to describe someone who's gone rogue um, and who therefore can be open to all forms of carcerality, uh, bombing, punishment, right, this whole spectrum of punishment that native people in border towns are treated as if we're off reservation according to kind of the counterinsurgency logic of, of that military notion of what it means to be off reservation. And so we're a threat, right, that needs to be contained. And that those practices of containment happen in multiple ways more than I can describe here. Um, policing, definitely, um, anti-panhandling laws, right, like laws that criminalize poverty and the condition of being unsheltered. Um, murdered and missing indigenous women and girls. There are actually three border towns that are um, listed in the top 10 most dangerous places for indigenous women and girls to live because of the rates of MMIWG2 that happen in those spaces. Um, and so border towns, so there's also vigilante violence. There are a lot of white supremacist groups um, that really troll and uh, do a lot of work uh, in border towns and organize really aggressively in border towns because they're such hyper-racist, anti-Indian spaces, right? Because the logic of settler colonialism is literally playing out on the ground every day because there are so many native people and we're not supposed to be there so we're a threat. And so this is the context of my organizing, my understanding about carcerality and abolition. It comes from the work we've been doing on border town violence, which is the term we use. Um, I think th thinking about abolition in this context, something, uh, the Red Nation is a grassroots organization, also volunteer run. Uh, we're a leftist, an explicitly leftist indigenous organization, but we also just developed and adopted our position on queer indigenous feminism. And so that's also a guiding framework um, in politics for what we do. And so for us, queer indigenous feminism centers two things. It's a survivor-centric framework of understanding what restorative justice looks like. 
um, because even our tribal nation, there's something called Diné Fundamental Law that exists in the Navajo Nation. It's, a, it's considered decol decolonial, right? And it's actually written about widely by scholars as a form of restorative justice and healing, right? These are two terms I think that are really important for us when we're thinking about abolition. But the problem with Diné Fundamental Law is that even though it draws from indigenous concepts and indigenous knowledge, it was drafted by men. <laughs> and so the notion, the, the way that uh, sexual and gender violence is adjudicated within Diné Fundamental Law is not a survivor-centric framework. In fact, the survivor of a type of violence um, is completely decentered in that. And so something that we've had to figure out how to do in our organizing spaces is we've kind of had to develop our own indigenous fe feminist framework of justice and our own practice of holding perpetrators accountable. And perpetrators can be perpetrators of a lot of different things. And so this is just a practice, and I can talk more about this if you have any questions um, about it, about what that actually looks like in practice. It's really difficult. But it's based on the second principle of queer indigenous feminism, which is relationality or kinship, right? How does one act as a good relative towards another comrade or towards another relative. Um, we do a lot of work in the unsheltered, um, what's commonly thought of as the homeless community, uh, the unsheltered population, um, especially native people in border towns and larger urban spaces like Albuquerque where I live and work is, is a larger proportion, right, of the overall unsheltered um, or poor population. And so instead of engaging in forms of charity, which is often what churches do um, or nonprofits do, we think of working in solidarity and organizing directly with tent cities, right, with unsheltered folks, with poor indigenous women, um, with our trans sisters, uh, folks who are living on the streets, and that this is also a form of reclaiming our relatives as, as kin and reclaiming them as relatives. And that that's a form of solidarity that I think is also part of this queer indigenous feminist practice um, that we engage in that directly confronts um, kind of the, the racialization of indigenous people in border towns. And so kind of the last point I'd like to make about thinking about transnational and multiracial solidarity um, right, is that queer indigenous feminism, I think, allows us to think really expansively about who is kin and who is a relative. You don't have to be indigenous to be a relative, right? You just have to act in a certain way in a relationship to the land. You have to be a caretaker, right? You have to be a protector, a defender, um, a water protector or a land defender. You have to embrace all of our relatives and not discriminate. Um, Red Milakotis, former Miss Navajo Nation, she's a comrade in the Red Nation. She has the saying, K'e, which is our notion of relationality and kinship is Diné people. K'e does not discriminate, right? And so that's kind of a fundamental way of understanding how you engage in solidarity. I think indigenous people are at our strongest when we're making new relatives and sort of forging new coalitions and federations um, across difference and across different struggles um, to build what hopefully will be a really strong movement you know, to abolish capitalism and colonialism once and for all. Um, because when we think about abolition, I think sometimes when we think about healing, um, which is this word I actually have a lot of trouble with, um, healing is often individualized within um, kind of a liberal mentality, and so healing becomes sort of self-help or self-care, and the way that we think about healing is a collective struggle for liberation, um, and so it's a politicized, collectivized notion of what healing looks like, possibly within an abolitionist, definitely within a decolonial framework, um, and so this is something that when we think about healing and we think about solidarity across a kind of a multi or a transnational or a multiracial uh, context, we're thinking about healing as pushing back against state violence, right? As engaging in something that pushes back, but then also we're building the future that we want to see, um, a future where we divest from the military, where we end US occupation everywhere, right? where we're divesting from the apparatus of imperialism um, and the racialized uh, forms of carcerality that most indigenous people experience when we have any sort of encounter with the state, most of it's through actually regimes of carcerality. That's like our citizenship, <laughs> basically, when it comes to the US state. Um, and so this is what we think of uh, when we're thinking of divestment and when we're thinking about working in solidarity transnationally um, and in a multiracial context. And so I'm gonna stop there. I have a lot more to say, but I really look forward to the Q&A. And I also really want to say how thrilled and pleased and honored I am to be here in Hawaii and to be trying to do everything that I can and the Red Nation can from afar to support our Kanaka Maoli relatives as you struggle to defend your land, to defend your, your mountain. As the Nae people, our mountains are our leaders. They hold the most sacred sites of our emergence and, and the history of how we understand how we came into the place that we now call our lands. And so we understand our relationship with our Mona, right? With our dish, 
Zifnatani is what we call them, our mountain leaders. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that and say that we are with you in this struggle and you can call upon us whenever you need to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Aloha mai. O helani sonora paleko uinoa no kulio o maeo. Um, and uh, as she said, I'm the chair of the Kalahui Hawaii Political Action Committee. You know, I was given a list of questions to answer, and I mean, I, I'm a community organizer. I felt like I was back in college, so I, I was like all nervous writing this essay, right? <laughs> And I was like, oh my gosh. But I'm, I'm glad it's a little <laughs> loose. I was like, <laughs> kind of stressing out there. Anyway, um, uh, you know, so one of the questions was how and where in your work, lives, relationships, and others um, in, the vir in, in the environment have you confronted sa state sanctioned forms of punishment? And um, as a Kanaka Maoli, having grown up in Hawaii in a US settler colony, um, I've confronted this from the from my earliest memories. I mean, it's part of growing up in Hawaii as an indigenous person. So, um, just kind of share a little bit of my background. Um, I did grow up in a housing project for the first 13 years of my life. Um, it was uh, Kamehameha, the fourth housing project. Um, it's kind of a rough neighborhood back in the 70s and the 80s. Um, we are basically, you know, my, my uncle sold drugs in front of the house. I had to walk through it every day. Uh, my other uncle was a professional burglar. <laughs> so I would walk down the stairs every morning and wonder what's gonna, what the house is gonna be filled with. Sometimes it was cases of cigarettes, cases of stereos, you know, and we had the best furniture in the house, in the whole housing, because our, all our furniture was stolen. And, you know, and then I had an aunt who also lived with us. I mean, I, we lived with my grandmother, you know, um, growing up. So I had an aunt who was a, a, she used to be a sniffer, which we call a sniffer, you know, pink. They would spray their nails and, and the rag and they would sniff. You know, so kind of grew up in this kind of household. And our house would get regularly raided, you know, so I kind of grew up as a Kanaka Maoli indigenous person here in Hawaii. And this is in the 70s and the 80s. So, you know, we didn't have Hawaiian immersion schools. We didn't have charter schools. We were just kind of finding our grounding back then as a people. You know, we're just, I mean, the Renaissance started in the 70s and it slowly began to flourish. And so, Back then, you know, it was, we were still kind of really living in that real colony, right, where even our minds weren't, even, weren't um, free kind of thing. So um, I kind of grew up always distrusting law enforcement. That was my thing. They were the enemies, right, because they were the ones that came and the people that we were always afraid of coming in our house. And so anyway, um, Kind of, sorry, I'm a storyteller, so I just kind of want to tell this story. You know, my mother graduated from medical school, which is freaking amazing, right? My whole family lived in the housing, and here she becomes a doctor. So then we moved to the suburbs. And I'm like, oh, wow, life is going to be better, right? Across the street, we're living across the street from a, a sergeant. He was a sergeant in the police force. And he beat his wife every night beat up his son in the garage who was 20 something years old. I was like, oh my gosh, we might as well just be back in the housing. You know, at least they were friendly, you know? They didn't want to associate with us at all, so. Um, so that was kind of like where we went. And then I came to the University of Hawaii, got to college. And my first semester here was uh, uh, basically kind of like what was life changing. Uh, my sister and I were dragged out of the classroom with, by two security. My sister was eight months pregnant. We had a racist professor saying things about Hawaiian culture like Ka'ahu Manu Mead, um, uh, Leini Ho Palawa, or 
this certain kind of necklace out of her pubic hair. Um, it just ridiculous things. We challenged him in class, we got pulled out, and I met Haunani K. Trask after that. <laughs> so Haunani K. was really important as, you know, in my development in understanding why, the why of how I grew up, right, poor, in a very violent in environment, full of drugs. I mean, never did drugs in my whole life because I saw the stupidity of drugs, you know, every day. Um, <clears throat> and she kind of taught us about the systemic nature of racism and oppression and how it, you know, you, growing up, you have this idea that you're, you're the blame, you're, in, you're, the, you're the reason why all of this is happening to you. It's, it's like blaming the victim, right? Um, you're the reason why they stole your land, your nation, and your language, your culture, all of this. It's your fault as a Kanaka Maoli, as an indigenous person. And the violence that they surround you with really, like, I mean, I don't know how, you know, Kale probably grew up in a lot of that too. Papa Kale ain't the, you know, <laughs> it's, it's kind of a rough neighborhood too, right? And his, and by the way, his mother was not just any kumuhula. I mean, she was a very well-known kumuhula. He grew up in a very prestigious cultural family. So, you know, and then look at where Kale ended up, you know, and I met him in prison. So anyway, so we, um, so Hanani K was my professor, opened our minds. I was like, oh my God, here is all the pieces of the puzzle coming together, you know, and really it was, that was another life-changing experience for me. Um, then, then one of the things we did was we brought over Angela Davis, um, our student group, and, she, and I, the weirdest thing, so she came over and she started talking about, she wanted to talk about the, um, oh, what was it? Um, she wanted to talk about the prison industrial complex. And when, when, she, when she said she wanted to talk about that, I was like, what? <laughs> you know, but and again, opened my eyes to the um, corporate interests um, in, in incarcerating our people. I mean, we are over incarcerated. As Kanaka Maoli, we make up about 20% of the population. We make up over 50% of the, the prison and jail population in Hawaii. And it could be more. People have told me it could be more because the way they count, they self identify. So it's not an exact science, but we believe it could be up to 60% of the population, maybe more, you know. So that was one of the things, so as a, um, as an, and again, brought kind of, that just kind of awoke me to um, getting involved into the, in the movement. So we began teaching in the, in the prisons, met Kale in Halawa Medium Security Facility, teaching Hawaiian studies programs there. And um, again, that opened my eyes when I saw all our people in there, like all of them, and hungry to learn and, and getting it right away. The political um, analysis of why, of the why. Why are you there? How did you get there? You know, what is the historical background? You know, we all have this, you know, for us growing up in Hawaii back in the 70s and the 80s, we didn't know. We didn't know, I didn't even learn about the overthrow till I came to college. We didn't know about that, that historical um, genealogy of how we got to where we are now. You know, why do we have third world statistics in Hawaii as the indigenous peoples living in the first world? Why, are, um, why do we have the highest um, infant mortality number in Hawaii? You know, why, do we, why are we dying from diseases that are controllable, you know, that are manageable? So all of these things, you know, was it was important to understand the why. But I just wanted to share that as an indigenous person growing up in Hawaii, the, you know, you grow up kind of distrusting the police. You grow up surrounded by violence, surrounded by all of these things. And it continues to today. These past few weeks, I've seen so many Aloha Aina arrested. With all the movements going on, the Mauna has awoken our people. 
So basically, and one of the things about, you know, there was another question about resisting it. And so <clears throat> continuing on in my story, one of the th first things I did research on was the place where I grew up, was Kalihi. And you know, I was so surprised to find out that our progenitors, our, our, our most famous ancestors, used to live in Kalihi, Wakea and Haumea, and the very place where we lived was where Haumea would regenerate herself and become a young woman every few years so that she can recreate and have more and more children. And I mean, what an amazing and beautiful culture. What an amazing and beautiful history. History, I never had any idea growing up that I was living in such a special place. All I could see was the violence, the blood, the piss, you know, all of that, right? We had a gun behind our, our couch. So those are the things that you're like, oh my gosh. But that was part of reconciling your, myself as a Kanaka Maoli as an indigenous person, and we all go through this, I think. When we find out the truth of where and how we got here and where we came from, it, then it becomes this process of reconciling yourself. It becomes about um, reconnecting with your culture, your the aina, and then you become the aloha aina. That's, that's, what, that's the key to resisting. For me, that's what I see here in Hawaii. Resisting, um, resisting uh, law enforcement, resisting the state, resisting corporations who are behind everything, you know, we, that's, what, that's, that's what we become. And Kale is one now. He's full time, yeah, 100%, 100%. Aloha, I know. <laughs> so, um, so I just think that reconnecting to the land and reconciling and finding, and, and right now what's happening in Hawaii, the Mauna is a big part of it and of waking us up as a people. We, the Aloha Aina movement is stronger than it's ever been, ever been. And it's, it's, it speaks to the power of the people and building our own systems of power. You know, to resist that power which to me, sometimes it's daunting, because if you think about what's happening on the Mauna, just a handful of people with no money, right? You go up there, you, I mean, we don't have money, we don't have an industry supporting us. Going up against a multi-billion dollar corporation and holding that multi-billion dollar corporation, multinational corporation, by the way, off for 10 years, that to me is so amazing. That's people power. That's aloha aina power. That's the resistance here in Hawaii. Um, and, you know, building networks, that was the last question. Sorry, I'm still on my essay uh, <laughs> that I was writing. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So building the systems of power, you know, and we kind of saw this back in the 80s. You know, globalization, the rise of globalization, nation states become the doormats to corporations, corporations running the world, Mark saw it, you know. So what has happened, social media, um, with, with the rise of globalization, all of us building networks as grassroots indigenous organizers. Great example, Standing Rock and Mauna Kea. Our Mauna Medics um, leader, Dr. Kalama Nihil, she went to Standing Rocks and learned from them and started the Mauna Medics here on, uh, in Hawaii and on Mauna Kea. And that's, you know, that, that's part of the networking. We learned from, from Standing Rock. Our leaders went up there, learned a lot, brought it back to Mauna Kea. When, when they tried to take us down that, that one week, that first week when the governor made his announcement, we were ready and organized. We had, um, we had the medics, we had an educational um, institution, we had free food, we were clothing people, we were giving out free blankets, we were organized and ready. And that's the power of networking. That was learning from Standing Rock, learning from other indigenous peoples around the world, and being able to um, push back against that. But um, yeah, so that's, pretty much kind of basically what I wanted to say. 
Um, sometimes it does seem hopeless, you know, because, um, you know, if you try to navigate within the system, it's, it's exhausting. You know, if you try to um, navigate within the, the legal system, the judicial system, all of that, it's very exhausting. Um, but we just have to have hope in Holomua. But mahalo, aloha. Hi, thank you for having me and inviting me, Laurel. I'm not sure where she went. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and I just wanna, um, I won't name their names, but I just wanna bring my ancestors into the room and for not only just support, um, but also be for guidance in our conversation. Um, I am from and originally from LA, but I am a descendant of chattel slaves, sharecroppers, and freedom writers. Um, and that kind of legacy that I am in is what grounds my conversation and discussion of not only punishment, but abolition. Um, and being black in the United States uh, has always meant that you are always thought of as a threat, as a criminal, as someone who is undeserving of any space. Um, and that has pushed even my own rearing in how we see punishment, not only in our own domestic spaces, um, but the ways in which my family members, those who were incarcerated, such as my father, um, have experienced premature death, dying early, um, and different ways of punishment and, and a lack of investment in health and wholeness. Um, that I even see in my family and also um, in the African diaspora. Um, and for, so for me, that's what grounds me in this fight. Um, black liberation grounds me in this fight. Um, and what also grounds me in this fight is connection and kinship around fighting against anti-black violence and harm. Um, and and the, that becoming the, the mode of solidarity in which I operate in and thinking about abolition and fighting towards that. Um, and so both in LA and New York City, I have uh, mainly been working and fighting around police abolition. Um, and uh, my very first teacher around this is this organization called the Los Angeles Community Action Network, um, who fought largely to reduce policing that was happening in a neighborhood called Skid Row. Um, that is a containment strategy and a serial dispossession strategy um, of the city of Los Angeles. Um, and they reduced what was considered the most highly policed community in the United States around 06 and 09 um, to produce some abolitionist practices to reduce through legal fights, through method, mechanisms, of, mechanisms of community control and divestment. And learning from them uh, in LA as part of like research and as a young person, I'm still a young person, um, but taking that into some organizing I've done around police abolition in New York City was very fruitful. Um, so I've been a part of various organizations, the Coalition to End Broken Windows Policing um, and also the Stop the Raids Coalition. Um, and these were um, different organizations that we're fighting against a kind of new policing shot, not a new, but rather an iterative policing strategy happening in cities across the United States that were just, as some people have mentioned, um, targeting poor people, policing poor people, snatching, catching, and caging poor people, um, taking them out of their homes, raiding them, um, and also policing people in their neighborhoods for very, very minute, small crimes, or thought to be crimes. Um, and that made New York City uh, unlivable. And so with the Stop the Raids Coalition, one of the things that were, was happening um, was that uh, the NYPD was conducting gang raids in uh, New York City housing. Um, and most of those caught up in these gang raids were whole families, <laughs> people registered in gang databases that were as young as four years old. 
um, and various raids happening throughout public housing in, in uh, New York City to take them out of their homes. Uh, the only form of real uh, state care for housing in New York City other than the shelter system. Um, and so in that practice, we really work to try to organize to stop the raids. Um, but in the context of organizing in New York City with a lot of corruption and the strong code of nonprofits or the nonprofit industrial complex, we found little room to produce any legal and policy avenues that would um, hinder the real agenda of abolition. Um, so we stuck to the small scale work of building community, which took the form of popular education, which took the form of uh, holding uh, family and community days, uh, which took the form of cobbling our money together to, for example, pay one's union dues while they were incarcerated so that they can have a job coming out of lockup. Um, and sending letters, sending letters between um, inside and out to, to build community to try to figure out how we can uh, solve this problem through kinship. Um, because, I mean, long story, <laughs> right? But a lot of deceit and corruption to figure out how to move city council in a way that would allow for some change. Um, I, another example of some abolitionist work I've done in New York have been to stop the hiring of a thousand cops. Um, that happened back in 2015 uh, after Eric Garner's death, right? And it was an a, amazing political moment in terms of the uh, amount of protests um, that was happening around policing in New York. Um, but still, this investment uh, especially bringing William Bratton, who is like the proponent of broken windows policing, um, to uh, as New York City Police Commissioner. Um, and so while we were not able to um, stop the hiring of a thousand new cops, what we did was we put in place an understanding and an idea around divestment and what the monies could go to and ultimately has shifted how we can organize around policing by and this is in large part most conversations around divestment, which is this is a social good. Our, our tax monies should go to social goods, and it's not po the police. Um, and I think in, even in that uh, organizing landscape, um, still, again, in New York, the kind of corruption of major, major nonprofits um, in di distracting or not only just distracting, but also uh, repressing the political agendas of different grassroots organizations. And so for me, in doing abolitionist work and organizing with people on the ground, it has been uh, divesting from different, not engaging in different systems that I think would co-opt or corrupt our, our political agenda. Um, so I actively, uh, and with others, uh, attempt to not be and participate with 501c3s, even though I think that they can be useful um, in some regards, um, but some regards. <laughs> and this is like a larger discussion. Um, but also I find that in that work, um, uh, anti-black violence especially in the organizing realm, right? Because I, we went, I was, some of us in the room uh, were at the emergent strategy uh, discussion that was happening or workshop at the American Studies Association. Great book about organizing, helpful book. Um, and one of the things that was being said that in terms of um, abolitionist uh, organizing is that sometimes the thing that we're striving for, abolition, is often not even in our own practices of organizing. And that kind of principle with abolition is also what I hold when thinking about anti-black violence and how that perpetuates. Um, and so those are some of the things that I have taken in my work around punishment, around abolition, and I'm looking forward to more discussion. Hello, good evening. Um, hello to Laurel for having me here and to the panelists and also really grateful for everyone in the room and being in this space. 
Um, I'm going to just talk a bit about things that I think I'm inspired a bit after hearing everyone else talk um, today. And um, one of the things I was thinking about is how I came to the work that I'm doing today, which is a, a critical analysis of U.S. immigration laws that are designed to rescue women from gender and sexual violence, but only by reproducing and enhancing the prison state. Um, and I was thinking back to when I first started actually working at a nonprofit. It was an Asian American nonprofit legal center in, in LA. And um, at the time, we had the opportunity to sign on to a multiracial platform to critique and try and end crack cocaine sentencing laws in the state of California. Um, but our organization said that we couldn't do that um, because we only represented victims and we didn't represent criminals. And I never felt so alone uh, in my work. So. Um, and as part of the work during that time, one of the difficult things, too, is that um, the organization was advocating for, um, for preserving victims and also expanding safety. Um, but by doing that, um, safety meant it was anti-black. By doing that, safety meant it was about reproducing policing. And by doing that, safety meant that it was about separating this relationship between those of us who supposedly belonged and those of us who didn't. Um, and it kind of pushed me to think about actually not about trying to belong, but to think about unbelonging as ways to build new relationships within our own community and with others. Um, and it was later then um, that I stopped working on that project and actually went to my first conference, The Revolution Will Not Be Funded, which was an inside sponsored conference, a critique of the nonprofit industrial complex in LA and also globally. Um, Later, when I was working in the Bay Area, um, for the first time, there was these new laws that were created to provide visas for undocumented women uh, who were survivors of different forms of gender and sexual violence. And I thought to myself, you know, why is it that suddenly the state is interested in bringing in and including and protecting women from communities that it has been raiding and policing for decades? Um, and part of that work, I don't know why I'm so emotional, sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, and during that time, um, there, everyone was really excited, um, in part because in the anti-violence movement, it was the first kind of legal tool that was available for undocumented women. And, um, and so as I learned more about it, um, part of the sort of caveats of the tool is that first you have to say that you will be certified to agree to participate and cooperate with the police. And that eligibility just allows you to apply for the visa. It doesn't guarantee that you're gonna get the visa. So what these visas were doing over time is that they were changing the landscape of immigrant rights activist work. Um, it was pushing advocates um, who were working with clients to have to build relationships with local law enforcement and creating a divide between those organizations and other immigrant rights organizations that were saying no cooperation with ICE, no cooperation with local law enforcement. Um, so literally, right, this is about splitting communities and splitting politics. But even further, what does that mean to tell someone that the only way you deserve to sort of not be sent out is if you're going to actually cooperate and speak the language of law enforcement when it's that same agency that's pushing you and your own community out at the same time? Um, so much of this critique around the U and the T visas, one is sort of around domestic violence and the other one is around sex trafficking, um, is that they actually are not necessarily there, um, or I should say they are there to rescue um, victims or to rescue women, but to do so by turning them into enforcers of the state. Um, and that's something that I think, you know, folks up here are talking about resisting, and I think that that's something we have to resist and to think of new ways um, to bring people together that isn't about bringing them closer to the state or that isn't about allowing the state to use us to police other communities. Um, and this, I think, also for me has been about finding different ways to think about um, how to talk about immigration within the broader genealogy of women of color, black feminist, and indigenous feminist theory, about having different relationships with each other and to the land that isn't about punishment um, and that isn't about rights. So not rights, but instead thinking about relationality and thinking about relations, um, which Melanie had mentioned as well. Um, and, and additionally, 
um, in the work that I was doing, both at the organization in the Bay and in my own research, um, one of the challenging things for my own writing was that I found that the law, you know, actually desires our stories, right? We're so used to kind of saying the law doesn't want to talk about, the law doesn't want to talk about us, but actually what I was seeing was that the law really wanted the stories of immigrant survivors, and it wanted those survivor stories to be in a particular way. Um, not only just about victimization, but about being able to speak and to be credible, to be able to snitch, right? These actually, these kinds of visas, even though we don't call them snitch visas because there are snitch visas, they operate in the same kind of logic, right? And so what kind of language was this law trying to write to turn women into enforcers? And so I thought to myself, you know, if to survive means you have to survive over somebody else's death, then how can we talk about this where we don't only just prioritize survivor? What if we were to actually talk about how people are failing survivor and what kind of futures that provides when we fail the survival that the law demands of us? Um, a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to be at a conference in LA on uh, blackness across Europe and um, was really grateful to be able to hear Vanessa Thompson speak. And one of the things that she said in her work was, you know, what if we actually, instead of thinking about policing as something that brings us safety, what if we thought about militarism as policing? How would that actually change the way we think about our relationships, not only to the land, but to borders? And so one of the problems, I think, um, within an immigrant rights framework, as well as US immigration law, is that we only talk about it at violence when people cross borders, but we don't talk about how borders cross people, um, how they erase nations that are already on the land, and how they actually end up, in many ways, um, trying to mark indigenous peoples as alien to their own land. And I'm drawing really heavily from Letty Volpe's work here. Um, and uh, lastly, I was thinking about the most recent 2016 ban on sex trafficking in Hawaii, and one of the frameworks around this particular new piece of legislation was to say that Hawaii was a, quote, last state, um, that it was not as modern as other states, and it now could possibly be modern by trying to fight, quote, modern day slavery. And that, to me, is a huge problem, to use this language of modern day slavery, which usually tries to reference white slavery, but actually uses anti-black logics to then say that sex work is a frame of modern day slavery. And then on top of that to say the Hawaii is more backwards because it doesn't have an anti-trafficking bill yet compared to all the other states. But as we know, anti-trafficking sex work bills have actually been used to police sexuality. They've also been used to reproduce global capitalism. And further, they've been used to increase the corporate role in detention and policing of migrants. So. <laughs> So that's not, um, you know, I give no fucks about that. So um, and instead, if we were to thought about um, what folks mentioned up here, um, about how we can actually develop a politics of care, and I think that black feminist work has really informed for all of us what it means to actually think about care and not carcerality. Um, to actually think about building different kinds of relationships, um, ways of being with each other rather than a policing of ourselves. And that's sort of my hope when I think about um, what it means to resist is to also resist all these terms, you know, when the state wants you, right? Um, and, and that's, I think, what I'm always trying to sort of think about is, is to not be in practice with that, um, but to also think about what kind of futures might be there when we choose to fail or are put in positions to fail that kind of survival that the state is constantly trying to prop up um, and use in order to expand policing and punishment. So, thank you. I just like listen. I don't like even talk, but um, aloha mai kako, kalani opua ko uinoa, no wai anai mai ao. Uh, I am from Waianae. Uh, my ohana is the Ke Amo ohana and the Kipapa ohana from Kahana. And I'm Kanaka Maoli. I'm Chinese. I also have German, Irish, etc., etc. Very typical of Hawaii. And um, so I'm here as a daughter of uh, two industrial complexes, one the military and one, the prison. Uh, my dad was in the military and my mom was uh, incarcerated for a number of years in my childhood. And um, I stand at a precipice also as, as Mahu Wahine. Um, and so I think I come to this panel in terms of thinking about abolition and imagining a world 
that is less dependent upon predation and punishment, in part because as a child, uh, I learned very early um, about punishment because I broke or crossed a border or a border crossed my body, you could say, uh, when I was a young child and would be punished for doing things too girly, right? Or not being allowed to use the girl's bathroom, right? There's these architectural ways that gender policing uh, reinforces a kind of uh, missionized uh, surveillance and punishment. And uh, I inherit a legacy. We are here in a space uh, that has uh, a legacy uh, that is connected to a kind of missionization here in Hawaii. And I think it's really also transformative that we get to be in this space to talk about really radical abolitionist politics. So I'm really grateful for the way that uh, change is also a constant. And I'm reminded of that when I breathe. Hmm. We get to pause, we get to reimagine, we get to redefine. So I'm grateful for all of the beautiful stories and um, experiences and love and um, creation stories that come out of uh, sharing this space and time. Uh, and also our ability to transcend space and time through our radical relationality. Uh, I also come to this stage by way of being, um, I have really big problems with the word survivor, but I, I don't know um, what other word, I mean, that's kind of like the buzzword in the nonprofit industrial complex, but I, I feel like in a lot of ways, you know, um, I've experienced uh, a kind of uh, policing around uh, sex work, you know. Uh, for a while, my friend and I were forced into, I mean, you could say forced in a way, uh, into sex work uh, as young trans women uh, in Seattle, young uh, trans women of color just trying to survive in a world that was built on our erasure, literally. Uh, it's very interesting actually about uh, when we talk about this idea of, I like um, the unbelonging as a form of belonging. And I feel that uh, that really speaks to uh, the origins of my life in, in many ways. Uh, so my friend, um, when I was 16, she was uh, kicked out of her home because she liked to wear women's clothing. And her grandfather, who was a Filipino-American who served in the, in the military, said, you know, you are my grandson. You need to dress like a boy. And so she was kicked out of her home. And at the time, I was actually working at a nursing home. And I had a full ride scholarship to become a nurse. And um, but I, I just didn't really feel comfortable in institutionalized spaces. And I don't think I ever will. Um, but she told me the story that she had been kicked out of her home and that she was pooching, you know, sex working to, to survive. And so I invited her, her into my home and my parents said, oh, she cannot stay here. So I ended up leaving my job right after receiving employee of the quarter. Uh, and I didn't give a fuck because um, the institutions just never give a fuck about me. So like, it's easy for me to just go in there, slay, and just leave. <laughs> so um, what does that mean? Well, there's a politics of belonging through unbelonging and a kind of queer indigeneity that I think helped my sister and I at the time weave together uh, survivorship on the streets of Seattle in her Toyota Tercel, her 1996 red Toyota Tercel. Um, today she's like a millionaire, but back then um, uh, we had a different uh, existence, you know. Um, but it was that, that love, that deep love through struggle, 
you know, and it reminds me of a, of a koa, you know, the koa tree and, and the seed of a koa. And I'm thinking of Brian Kuwata's amazing work, how he talks about, uh, so the koa is this amazing tree in Hawaii that can withstand a lot of wind. And sometimes the seed can sit dormant for 25 years. And the only way that, that the seed uh, blossoms is through being cracked and slammed and beaten uh, before uh, it starts to uh, become undone. And then in that undoing, it, it grows into the most powerful uh, tree that we have here in Hawaii. And it is that tree that we would often use to build our va'a, our canoes that would allow us to navigate across long distances. So actually, I wanted to bring the story back to our more than human relatives uh, who are with us in this space. You know, we're wearing this lei, and uh, I'm reminded that um, that there's escapement, you know, the connection to ancestors, the connections to the types of abolition work that we do. And I don't mean this in a, in a sort of new agey kind of way. Um, I mean it in the most radical abolitionist way possible. Um, I feel that the reconnection to Aina, Aina is land, and Aina is everything that nourishes our being, including joy. And I've spent a long time being angry, and I'm still angry, but I think it happens through uh, radical joy that I find anger. And anger can be very nourishing and can help to crack the seed so that something new and transformative emerges. So I just want to end with that. Mahalo. Hello, everyone. Wow. I don't know what to say. That, um, I have to admit that I'm sort of new coming into thinking about abolition and this concept and its practice. And um, my mind is, is just blowing up. So I, I have some thoughts, but I, I wanna actually first invite all of you who uh, may have questions to, uh, on your cards. Uh, I think Laurel and Linda will pick them up and then they'll, they'll sort of go through them. So please hold it up if you have some questions. And then um, first, I wanted to invite our panelists, if you have um, any questions or comments for each other, to have this conversation first before I, I throw my two cents in. <laughs> Anything you'd like to add or ask? Well, maybe I'll just, if I could, while we're collecting all the cards, and I'll just add a few themes that I heard I thought was really amazing. And one was just a kind of um, how many stories uh, deal with the violence uh, of the carceral state, of colonialism, of racism, um, and it, it's violence that manifests in many different ways. But I, I think about the uh, lyric from uh, Skippy Iowane, it talks about we are the evidence, not the crime. Right? So these are all the evidence of the violence of colonialism, of settler colonialism, of that dispossession. Um, I heard of many uh, examples of creating a, a, a people's alternative to the state. Uh, but that is also really um, uh, difficult because we're often seduced into a collaboration with that power. Um, where we're on this border of, of um, victims becoming enforcers, um, you know, working against our own communities in some cases, um, but that, that border sometimes 
that, that was a theme that I also heard, the borders that cut us in half sometimes, cut us off from each other, uh, keep us out of certain spaces. Um, and yet, uh, one of the themes was a kind of a, uh, the escape, the, the feral nature of, of this kind of abolition politics that is always breaking free and um, finding open spaces to live free. Um, another thing I heard was uh, relationality and relationships and kinships. That was a sort of a, a refrain throughout. Uh, and that's where our power, one of our superpowers, I think, is, is those relationships. And it's not just the relationships that go inward and make our, uh, our communities uh, you know, hold really tight, although that's important, but it's really important to reach out beyond uh, to those uh, kin uh, from other places. Um, I heard also that um, there was a need, I, I heard about alternative kinds of governance that come from traditional knowledge and practice and that come from emergent practices in our communities. Uh, so it's not a lawless space, which is how the Mauna has been uh, depicted, but it's a space that's full of law, but it's about uh, law that's accountable, responsible, um, respectful uh, of all relations. And, um, and that sometimes uh, an abolition politics requires challenging um, traditions in our own cultures. So whether it's uh, challenging Diné foundational law or asserting kapu aloha, which some people say that's not traditional, and yet it's so, it's so much is, <laughs> right? So uh, that was something that was really cool. Um, and then uh, just to end with your beautiful story of uh, the koa seed, you know, that all this struggle and all the suffering and all the, the burdens that we carry uh, through this work are the scars that are necessary for that koa seedling to open up and to become the tree that it needs to be. So um, with that, we have some questions that we'd like to uh, share. Okay. Or ask our panel, right? Okay, thank you. Oh, this is a long, this is an essay <laughs> in of itself. All right. The, yeah, the colonial capitalist system seems designed to divide and conquer through coercion corruption and co-opting culture and promising uh, an ounce of what feels like control to certain individuals in the indigenous community um, to break unity and solidarity without yielding any pow actual power. How do we fight against this kind of subtle, pernicious cultural violence and stay united in solidarity to seek true liberation? That's a really good question. I just want to make a comment about that. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I do have a job, but then I'm, I, I'm in the movement. It seems like 100% of my time, and I, I do, I see that a lot. What's happening now? I mean, our movement has grown, and. You know, we have Mauna Kea, and we have Kahuku, we have Kalai Loa, we have Waimanalo, we have all these pockets of con people rising in political consciousness. And some of them not really fully understanding, you know. But when it comes to that, the division, that's a big one. Because that's how they get us. And I mean, I, I don't have the answer for it, but as a person who is intimately involved in many of the movements, mm -hmm. I see it. I see it happening. I see the division, but then you think, okay, what's more important? The perception or what's really happening? You know, the movement as a whole or the, the little pettiness and the divisions? I mean, it's not really pettiness, some of it, but there is, and it, it's, it's, it's our biggest, I, I think of it as one of our biggest enemies from the, you know, kind of falling apart from the inside. And it's almost like the state, that's what they're waiting for. You know, they, they wait for that. And so how do you keep it together? I, I, you know, that's a hard one. And I think our culture, you know, and always relying on our aina and following. And I love that story, Tita. 
of the co op. Thank you for that. Um, following our Aina, and how Antipu always says, you know, the Mauna is our guide. Yeah. And that we always go back to the Aina. So, oh, that was really loud, sorry. Uh, anyone who's familiar with the, the contemporary history of the Navajo Nation knows that um, homophobia and just really basic forms of gender discrimination are actually enshrined in tribal law. <laughs> it's not just in a fundamental law. There's like same-sex marriage ban that's in effect since 2005 in the Navajo Nation. Um, so really kind of uh, typical kinds of, of discrimination. And what often happens in the Navajo context is that people weaponize tradition and culture to discriminate, um, particularly when it comes to gender and sexuality. And then those who are open to thinking about plural or diverse genders and sexualities will still contrive some sort of interpretation of tradition that reinforces binaries, for example. Uh, and it's just such bullshit. It's all bullshit. And I think what's really important um, for me as somebody who's an indigenous feminist, who's also intimately involved in a lot of the movements, land-based movement, land -based movements, uh, movements against police violence, right? There's, they're all connected. And I mean, police violence is an environmental issue um, for indigenous people. That what I do is I just, I push back a lot against that. And I think we really need queer feminists, right, who have an abolitionist perspective, and I'm so happy to hear so many of my other comrades up here talk about kinship and relationality because honestly, like to be a Diné person means like you actually have to be a good relative and you treat people a certain way, and that is always completely left out of these conversations from these traditionalists who are always trying to discriminate um, against our relatives who have uh, plural genders and, and sexualities, and so, I think it's understanding that tradition can be weaponized for political agendas. And when we understand it not as something that's untouchable, right, but we understand it in the field of political struggle, then that helps us to start to see the ways in which tradition works really differently politically, right, to do different kinds of work, including to discriminate. And so, I, like I said, I push back, I write op-eds in the Navajo Times, which is our tribal newspaper. I hold symposia that really piss people off. It's not terribly, popular, but uh, it's something that we're just, I'm just not going to stop doing because, I, I mean, and I'm not a hero, I'm just like, it's just like, knock that shit off. And I actually said this in my intro to Native Studies class the other day when we were talking about tradition, about half my students are Native, a lot of them are Navajo. I was like, don't you think that when a tradition becomes something that's used to like discriminate and to harm your relatives, you should probably throw that shit out. Like that's not a tradition that you should continue practicing. And so my students were like completely blown away by it. But when we use the word tradition, especially indigenous people like in the Southwest, I think we really need to be critical about how we're using it and weaponizing it to do harm. Because abolition is the opposite of doing harm, right? It's the opposite of punishment. It's about care. It's about bringing people in and showing that politics and that relationality together. So great question, thank you. How can we, the community, help to organize around abolition? Could you cite some specific ways that we can work on this now in Honolulu? Any ideas, suggestions? Let's have an abolition reading group at Laurel's house. <laughs> Brady does. She, she's, she's our advocate on uh, prisons and abolition here in Hawaii. But, but and it's she's been working at the ledge for I don't know how many years, maybe decades could be. I mean, gosh, probably decades. Um, we I see her a lot at the ledge, advocating for bills, um, you know, for pre-child, um, you know, to get rid of pre-child bail and and all of that. Um, it's it's freaking exhausting, you know? And it's like, you know, putting your finger in a dam that's about to crack open, you know, basically. So it, it is difficult 
It's up to us. It's up to us. There's yeah. more of us than them. All right. Could you discuss sex work in an abolitionist framework, i.e., complete legalization versus partial versus no state surveillance, et cetera, et cetera? Any, any thoughts about that? Well, how much money do you have? <laughs> that will determine the answer. No, just kidding. Just kidding. Um, as a. Um, Gosh, um, I've worked many years in sex work. It's probably the most liberating work I've done in my life, straight up. Um, in large part because in quote, normal society, like going to school. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I have to laugh, because it's like, it's like, it's real. Like going to school, becoming a lawyer, doctor, <laughs> Right, these things that your family can be proud of um, was never really um, liberating for people like me. So then when I got into a situation where you have a cisgender, white, heterosexual man who worships the ground you walk on and pays you lots of money for it, right? Um, and I don't even have to have sex with them. That's a kind of power. That's a kind of liberation and it's kind of refreshing because um, you know, a lot of the institutions are basic as hell and they're kind of nails. So um, an abolitionist framework for me would have to make institutions that govern our everyday lives liberating and then I'll live there. Um, if there is room for the a nonprofit industrial complex to work with or assist, what does that look like? like how do we how do we do it in an iterative way, maybe? Uh, I've never worked for a 501c3, um, and I don't plan to, um, but I, I do work in academia. Which is kind of like a 501c3. <laughs> yes, it is, and it's, yeah, it's pretty whack sometimes. Um, but the great thing that, um, I mean, there are many possibilities. So, I, like I said, I have uh, the Los Angeles Community Action Network. Like I said, is one of my first teachers in abolition, and they are a nonprofit organization, um, and they put amazing, immense amount of work to reducing policing in an area um, that was highly policed. Um, and should and now, like your claps are like real because recently. Um, uh, LA Can has been featured in HBO's uh, Why It's Knox's Problem Areas about police abolition, for example. Um, and they continue to be both a site and a teacher about abolition. Um, and it's shown me the room in which you can grow and produce that, right? The room in which you can fight that. Um, but in their particular context, they had uh, legal support, they had other forms of mobilizing across LA that allowed them not to back down on uh, abolitionist principles. And so I think context matters, 
And I also think that um, uh, when it comes to abolitionist work, especially on the policy realm and the legal realm, like there are so many um, gray areas and slippery slopes that you can get into. And it's very hard not to um, fight, not to get in a space or get stuck in a space where the actual agenda of harm is is not reduced, okay? Uh, so for example, there are many different uh, legal fights that uh, I have studied and researched with this Los Angeles Community Action Network. Um, and uh, Skid Row is a place where there are a lot of houseless people, um, mostly black, mostly poor. And in this area, uh, they use homeless or houseless people's right to property, rights, mm -hmm. rights to property through the legal frame in order to reduce policing. And I think it was really important that it was their mere belongings that allowed them to say and tell the state and reduce the state's response uh, to dif routinely dispos uh, dispossessing them. And they did that through series of legal fights, series of them. Um, that led to successfully reducing policing um, and other legal fights that also successfully maintain affordable housing or seemingly affordable housing for poor people in the area. And um, I should give a larger context that Skid Row is located in downtown LA um, that is uh, booming, uh, entertainment, commercial development, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so the policing was definitely happening and, co and, and coinciding with the gentrification, as well as the policing that we saw in NYCHA housing and in, in East Harlem and different parts of Harlem that we were organizing with in, in New York City. Um, and we saw the kind of stronghold of uh, major nonprofits like the Communities United for Police Reform, um, that when the 1,000 new cops uh, mantra and ultimately uh, decision happened at city council, that organization was so bent on the distraction, which was on body cameras, <laughs> rather than the fact that you had this major budget for police. Um, and so I think, um, and even, and I'll say, even in organizing in that fight uh, for stopping the thousand new cops, there were people part of that major group, Communities United for Police Reform, that were part of our group trying to stop the thousand new cops because they saw the limited ability they can create change in that organization. So we saw the ways in which people, and also some people who were in City Hall as well. So I think it's important to see how nuanced this organizing work is, and not just like, you know, um, and how people are repeatedly trying to slither through it. Right, because there's so many, there's possibilities and there's also real limits. Um, and so I think where the, I think in any space, right, it's about how the work can thrive and really produce life for people. Um, and if you can do that, then you're doing the work. And if that is under a 501c3 or in some part of it <laughs> or some little thing you just carved out because it sucks for the most part, then cool. You know, but for me, I've seen how, and especially as a black queer film, how repeatedly I'm often um, negated, erased, uh, and harmed in those spaces. So they're not for me. Um, so I just don't, I don't participate. But there are, there is room. But uh, you know, that's just my approach. And there's possibilities. So. Okay. How can we in Hawaii problematize not only over incarceration, but all policing as an act of state violence rather than public safety? And this is particularly true in this moment when building relationships with the police has become an important strategy at Mauna Kea. So how do we think beyond just uh, that couple aloha with, you know, I, uh, you know, before, um, in July, we were really flabbergasted 
by the number of police officers. Um, they even called the National Guard. They called the, um, they used the dole care officers. They used the sheriff's office, which is the governor's own, you know, police force. Um, and we were just totally flabbergasted. But I will say this, I wasn't surprised. Because at the ledge, this past session, when you look at their budget for security, and it's not very, very clear what it's for, you know something's going down. So that was one of the things that we did um, advocate at the ledge. We, tr we really went after that money. You know, they tried to you know, secretly allocate $2.5 million for security. No, it wasn't for the Mauna specifically, but it was, you know. But we, we were, you know, able to bring that to light. Um, and it is, sometimes you just gotta follow the money, you know, because um, recently, uh, a couple weeks ago, when I was in Waimanalo, I witnessed the first um, arrest there. I've been arrested too, but uh, you know, I choose not to because I, I have so much other work to do. Um, but uh, I witnessed the arrest there. They used a new tactic, the way they, they came in, um, very organized, using bikes as physical barriers around Wamanalo, and then they used. Then they started using that in, in Kalailoa. So new equipment. When when you see money going to to you know more money going to dole care, they they hired more in the last few years to build up you know to uh, this. The rise of criminalization of Kanaka Maoli in Hawaii is 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 just it's it's sky high right now. Um, they are using milit almost military force, military grade weapons. Um, and so when you look at the budgets, um, they hired, they, they did it, even did like um, a whole dole care um, uh, training facility this past few years. You knew it was coming. And then when, when um, Kahia asked for the budget for dole care, mm -hmm. they found out they, they actually um, bought an LRAD, which is a, um, yeah, a sonic weapon that can, um, have make you lose control of your your functions, you know your bodily functions and cause permanent damage. Um, these are military grade weapons, um, so th that's just one of the things. Um, going to the ledge, I think we've killed a lot of bad bills. We've called attention to a lot of these things that have happened, and you know it's not much like you said. You know sometimes it's just you're just working in one little pocket of the whole big mm. picture, um, but you gotta do it. I mean, it's just, you know, and if everybody kind of does their part, you know, we all kind of work together. And I think building those relationships and systems with each other, even with the law enforcement officers. Do you know how many tips I've gotten over the last few months? I mean, I knew when the Wamanalo arrest was going down the day before. My relationship with law enforcement, you know, so all of that, that's kapu aloha, that's, that's looking at new ways um, and cultural ways of doing things. I am mahalo. Um, so I actually sit on, so I also do um, institutional work. I sit on the board of Kahea, Hawaii Environmental Alliance. I'm outing myself. Um, but also I think it's really important that we follow the money. That's really, that's huge. $585 million is now going to a radar missile facility in Waianae. So if we wanna talk about police um, enforcement and policing, we definitely have to talk about militarization, right, Tina? Um, Laurel, right? Um, and we need to stop militarization. That's huge. Militarization is increasingly putting up more divisions it's definitely not making us safer. In fact, it's making us a target. That's why Pearl Harbor was a very fine example of uh, militarization and war here in Hawaii. And, and they just wanna continue on the war machine and we just have to stop it. Now, how do we stop it? Um, it's a really good question. It's gonna require all of us. Uh, and I think right now we're facing an even bigger crisis 
for some reason, crisis motivates people uh, to do things that they wouldn't normally do. So maybe military leaders will do things that they wouldn't normally do if they realize that there's a greater threat out there, like climate change. Um, things that are, you know, really challenging our human existence. Because uh, Earth doesn't really need us, and this is where I think traditional knowledge is really helpful. Papa Hanao Moku, Mother Earth is going to be just fine if we're not here. So, you know, we need to reverse that whole narrative. Like, humankind is not above nature. Nature is above humankind. Because this is the only planet we've ever known. And this is probably the only planet we will ever know. And for those of you who want to go space traveling, I think that's just great. I love Star Wars and Star Trek. But I don't think those are realities that nourish our sense of being. It's, it's like, it's play. But uh, we have to know where the limits of that play extend. And um, so, yeah, I'll end with that. Stop militarization now. Okay, I'm going to pitch this one to Kale Hall. Oh, you're, you're going to answer this? Yeah, one? I get some. Okay, okay, I get okay. Okay. my two cents. <laughs> yeah, I like what um, both you guys said, Kelani uh, and. Uh, but um, I think, you know, what I've been seeing up there on the Mauna is um, it's, it's really unreal. From, from day one, like, um, you know, you know the, the officers there, you know, they did arrest uh, Kupuna, but they had a hard time doing them. You know, a lot of them were crying. And, um, and it's just, you know, go back to what Kat said about Kapu Aloha. And I know it kind of sounds like one catchy, one phrase, like how they use Ho'oponopono all the time and things like that. But uh, I, I can really see, in fact, I, I cannot see any other way but, but that. And uh, over the last 117 or 18 days we've been up, or I've been up there, you know, there's been incidences where they seek you know, we come together as one family, like two incidences off, to, off my head, medical um, uh, concerns with the do care guys up the road. And, um, you know, they came down, where they came first for help was to the Kupuna tent, and they were taken care of. And, um, yeah, and it was unreal. And unfortunately, one of the guys, um, he went to the hospital and he passed away. But after that, they came back and they asked us for pule with the family, you know. So I, I see that the relationship, going back to the relationship is, is I believe is what's gonna okay this thing. You know? and, and that wouldn't be the first time. If, if these guys would jump over on our side, that wouldn't be the first time. Uh, from what I understand, there was a perfect example someplace in Singapore or someplace, you know, <clears throat> but that would be just awesome. Um, demilitarization. When they had the march over here in Waikiki, 30,000 people, you guys, yeah. Um, that night, it was going off in Pohakoloa. You know, it was, we saw an explosion from the campsite that would look like on sunset. And I, I got pictures of that. and. And it's just, it was like, uh, yeah, take this, you know, just a reminder. You know, we got uh, 30,000 guys on the street marching, Kapu Aloha and all that, and then the military goes ahead. And, and they wasn't bombing weeks before that. It was that day that of the march, that night, and then the next night. And you could smell them, because we had the corner winds that evening. So everything was coming straight to the camp. But uh, yeah, that was that was crazy. But you're right, demilitarization. <clears throat> Kapu aloha. So you will actually answer a little bit of the other question too. <laughs> but one um, one question I can I can pitch to you first is uh, follow up is could you discuss Pu'u Honua as an abolitionist project and maybe mention a little bit about what. 
ohana ho opakele is doing what you folks here. Well, ohana ho opakele, like um, uh, when I was on the inside, uh, that was one of uh, the groups that was um, that when Kakoo help us support us. Uh, as a matter of fact, the idea about um, asking to recognize an equinox date, which was the Makahiki, came from there. And when we did ask that, you know, it was like giving them one, one, um, uh, one offer they couldn't refuse. They had to do them, and, and that's basically uh, the same example with Kaho Olave. So, um, uh, pu, pu honua, um, you know, traditionally we can look up what that means, and, and it means, uh, you know, place of safety. And, um, you know, it was also people were pu honua, and, and, um, there's, there's, there's different uh, uh, examples. Today, you know, almost anything, anything that, uh, that uh, involves the Hawaiian culture, the living of Hawaiian culture and practice is known as a pu'u honua, a uh, hula halau pu'u honua. Uh, we have three different examples from pu'u honua Waimanalo to pu'u honua Wainai and uh, Makua. Every place on the inside, when we created our small little thing, after we went to the continent, we never had people like Hialani coming in and, and directing programs. We went up there and we were pretty much out of sight, out of mind. So it was what we know, what little that we, we never have, in fact, we did. We had, everybody was Kumu and Haumana. You know, so everybody's encouraged. We just created the space which everybody was encouraged to bust out what they knew. And um, <clears throat> so every place we went, it, it was known as a Honua. In Minnesota and Arizona, it was, Koka. at first it was Komako Honua, and then we changed them to Kokako, which includes everybody, not just us Hawaiians. And uh, that's what we named it. Every, every place we went was Honua. Uh, we had a Honua Ohalava prior to going to Minnesota. And um, for us, it was a place uh, that a safe place that we could come to on the inside. Um, that was a place where we could practice our culture. We could, um, we could, you know, be and and search and 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 regain who we were as Kanaka, uh, especially. Um, Kanaka with Kuleana and, and changing all these different thinkings. And uh, a, a big problem we have on the inside is the gangs. <coughs> so our Koka Ko Puuhonua was an, uh, an alternative to the gangs. So whenever they came, you know, you know we, we, we had strict rules. You know, when you came, whatever patch you was running, in the yard or out there, you left them at the door when you came in and you did your olikomo, your small little pule before you came in. And this small little pule is um, a pule that we uh, got from, from um, it's the 115th line of the Kumulipo where man comes on to the scene. And uh, when Haloa comes on to the scene, you know, he's, uh, Pure, you know, he's not coming patched up or, you know, uh, he's coming into the scene uh, pure, and that is the idea. When they came to the pool, they came in, whatever affiliation, they came in, uh, leaving all that behind, including the football pools, no transactions in our uh, space. But our goal was to create um, a safe place, and the Native Americans have that. They got this yard where they got sweat lodge, they got drum ceremony, they're able to do their practices uh, in, in the prisons up there. Hawaiians uh, did not have that. Um, and the, the reason we did not have that is because we never go through what they went through yet. So that's what I would remind the guys. They would tell me, well, how come they can and we cannot? I say, we can. We got to just do the same thing that they did. And the laws is all there, so we did. Um, so on the inside, um, even, even with uh, Ohana Ho'opakele, they kind of disagree with this, but um, I always tell them what you can do with the guys on the inside, some of whom never going to get out. 
you know, they got to have a safe place too. Um, but it's a place that they can come, they can practice their culture, they do their rituals, do their ole, recognize the important dates. Um, and, and that's basically on the inside. Ohana Ho'opakele, on the other hand, that idea of, about Pu'uhono came uh, when they were against all prisons being built on a big island. So they were against that. But the Kupuna wouldn't tell them, uh, okay, no, no one be against something, what you for? And came up with the idea of Pu'uhono. And they did pass a law, in fact, about six years ago. I forgot the name of the law, but to create that, um, uh, and they put together a, com uh, a committee of which I was a part of <clears throat> when I was here. Holomua uh, uh, So there are efforts, you know, uh, to go. But that that one, you know, I think we've been going around in circles for like six years, and kind of like we're not going no place. It almost like was one pacifier thrown out there by the governor to keep us spinning. You know, so they over there today where we was six years ago. So hopefully, hopefully Mauna Kea brought us together. We have a momentum now and hopefully we can uh, bring this up again and get more support and we can poke it through once and for all. Mahalo. <laughs> So last question, I'll, I'll just kind of ask everyone if you could just say like a really quick uh, thing, right, response. This is, uh, the concept of abolition seems to be well known in academia, but, uh, but not commonly understood in the general community. So what are some ways we can make more of the community aware of abolitionist concepts? So just boom, boom, boom. Oh. <laughs> yeah, just go down the line. This is your last become Pu'u Honoa. Become Pu'u Honoa, which means to become a being that affirms life. Become a being that um, brings darkness to light sometimes. Um, be a being uh, that creates space for transformation. Yeah. Um, I guess I don't actually think that abolition is commonly known in university spaces. If it was, that would change everything. Um, so, so I'm trying to be like, how can we talk about abolition? in university spaces and and also too you know to think about you know the people that that you want to talk to that are teaching or that are working at the university those are folks where it's not like that's their only point of reference in their life right like they also are doing work in the community too so i don't want to create this divide and act like you know those of us who are doing work in the university as if we didn't also have communities that we come from and we are a part of and that we are committed and accountable to. So I'm kind of interested more in thinking about how we can think about community accountability that brings um, different places together instead of assuming that one place is your only place, you know, because the university, if we think about it, and when I mean university, I guess really what I mean is, is, is the sort of Western US type of university. There's other kinds of schools, right? I'm talking more like UHRU um, but, or where I'm at. Um, so uh, in, in LA and I, and, and I think, you know, if, um, if we were to, to think about um, community accountability, it already sort of includes all of a different kind of conversation where it's, it's not just like you know, if you're in that space, then you, you aren't also already in other communities too. So, so I guess I would say that, so, yeah. Um, yeah, I would just say gather, gather uh, and like organize. So uh, I've been just doing, I just moved from the East Coast to Long Beach and now starting some more, some organizing that's organically happening out of uh, just police abuse um, and even private security abuse. It's, ri it's ridiculous. Um, but gathering and finding where the organic um, 
kind of synergies are happening happening around this, right? And using that as a platform to then begin to talk and to organize and mobilize people. And I find that that is that is that looks like knocking door to door, right? That looks like holding some event um, in the community. That look, looks like having some kinds of plans um, around organizing and keeping that forward. And I think um, teaching is also organizing. And I feel very privileged to teach at a Cal State, um, where um, I teach mostly working class students, um, mostly most of whom who are brown as well. And so it's been amazing even being at this new campus to been teaching for the last couple of weeks on abolition um, and prisons and things of that nature and to see like the lights in their heads, like, you know, just like the things light up. Um, and also the puzzleness and like the awkward, like, you know, <laughs> like body language of that one white student that like, wants to push you, but just like keeping the conversation going <laughs> and organizing, and, and, you know, and I just think that that's, you know, and having those like, m those kinds of conversations that aren't just like abolition, but also just like, what do you think in a world without no cops, no prisons, no border walls looks like? And to see how students' is, security and all, and all those things like begin to break down. Um, or how the kinds of, uh, the yeah, in our own security. Um, and, and to see that also on the ground as well. And also to see people already knowing what's up on the ground. So I think it's just gathering, so yeah. So I wanna point out the, you know, that the whole thing about um, the university and the community kind of divide. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't like that, um, and I, and I think that you know I agree with what she said about you know, you, you, all of you live in, in houses and in communities and you know it's not like you're you're living in a white tower, right? You, you're you shouldn't be so disconnected from your community, um, and the the number of academics or intelligentsia that have, that actually do work, you know, for the community are very few, and we need to increase that, you know. Um, and the other part of it is, to stop talking at this level when it comes, to talk to, I mean, talk to the community in a real way, you know. Um, I, I call myself the queen of fact sheets, because if there's an issue, make a fact sheet. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's the best way. You know, like make it so people can understand one sheet. Nobody has the time to read a, a you know, an article or a journal on it, you know? So, you know, just make it accessible. Make your knowledge accessible to the community, especially in you know, abolition and things like that. Um, stop living in that white tower because that's what's wrong with the system, right? The divisions. Start connecting. I mean, start getting to know your neighborhood and connecting, organizing in your own neighborhood to abolition, you, you can do it from anywhere. But mahalo. Oh, and I wanna see mahalo, Kyle, and everyone for having me here, and it's just an honor. I'm, I was like, why am I here <laughs> at first? <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, mahalo. I agree with everything everyone has said already. Uh, but I think that something that's important to remember is that abolition is a word that describes a set of practices that everyday working class people of color throughout the world have had to adopt in order to advance their liberation, right? And so when we're using, the term is important and it has a lot of different like genealogies behind it, but it's how we actually practice in political struggle together because um, we've been talking about kinship and relationality a lot, um, what it means to be a good relative, um, some Hawaiian terms I don't know, but I think I understand them. You know, that, that, that's okay, I'm an outsider here, it's actually refreshing, because <laughs> I'm always just talking about Navajo stuff. But um, that those, those are the practices that don't exist outside of the field of struggle, and that abolition doesn't mean a whole lot if it's not part of a really bold militant agenda for liberation. And that liberation is from imperialism, it's from capitalism, it's from colonialism, right? It's from white supremacy, it's from heteropatriarchy. And so 
advocating for those traditions and, and reminding ourselves that we're part of these traditions, long traditions of liberation and abolition describes one really important piece of that throughout the world, I think is really important. And the last thing, right, is that I think what these kind of traditions of liberation have taught me and kind of my ancestors and my mentors in the struggle is that this is also part of the reason why nonprofits can't lead things is because it's only movements of people who really believe that we can build an alternative future. And that that optimism, that revolutionary optimism, I think is another really key component of abolition. And it's really only revolutionaries and people who are part of the struggle from that ground up who remind us, I think about what the other world is possible and really try to build it together collectively through relationality and through kinship. And so when we're thinking about abolition, it's really how we practice a very politicized form of kinship together. And that's what abolition looks like in practice. And if we continue to do that, then we're engaging in abolition. And we don't really need a word actually to describe it. We just need to be free. So. Um, yeah, when Laurel first, first came up, I first met her on, in Hilo, but prior to that, she set this thing up, and I think it was Ron, uh, one of uh, Ohana Ho Pa Kelly guys, uh, who said, yeah, you gotta go, go talk to these guys. They went ask me, but you should be over there, not me, and you can talk about abolition. So I think, you know, oh, what is that? Oh, okay. And then um, about a, a couple days go by, then he calls me up and he asking me, hey, what do you think she mean about abolition? So I think, I don't know, I was going to ask you. So we go to our next meeting, then, and then Laurel comes to the meeting, and then uh, everybody is like this, one big question mark on their head. What is this? All the kupuna sitting down. And um, I hope you never feel too bad that everybody was getting on your case, but that was the big thing. What is this word? Why don't make one regular word? Like, like, like huli or something like, you know, turn over. But that was so funny. Yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, so I, I think it's pretty much, uh, yeah, if you can come up with a better, more easy word, you know. <laughs> Mahalo. <laughs> Thanks. Mahalo to all you guys also and everybody on the panel.
this was an amazing group of speakers and an amazing group of people here in, as participants in the struggle. Uh, we encourage you, if you haven't yet, to give us your emails so Hawaii Peace and Justice can keep in touch with you. Maybe a next step is a reading group or some other sort of gathering. And also, um, please help out putting away chairs and helping us take food home. We might have some food left over. And we'll see you all next time. Aloha. Aloha.